Okay, <clears throat> we are starting with our talk on recursion. Um, you need to know about functions and methods before you know about recursion because recursion is a unique property of functions and methods and in most languages recursion is something that can be done but it has side effects in that it's capable of taking up memory, freezing your program at best freezing your program if it's running out of control or at worst freezing your operating system. So recursion is something where you need to program with care but of course like any programming you should always know what you're doing. Um, so this is basically a lesson where I'm going to get you to the point hopefully where you know what you're doing with recursion. First of all Recursion has this rather, well, let's put it this way. Um, recursion has this property where a function or a procedure calls itself. That's the idea of recursion. But before we go into recursion, we'd like to talk about a little bit of math. Um, and we're going to talk about the factorial. Now, um, that code that you saw in the slide is repeated here. And um, we have two, two routines here that you might notice. Um, I'm going to go to a, I'm going to use green. We have a procedure or a method called main, and we have a um, function called fac, F-A-C. And notice I can tell that this that main is a procedure because its data type is void meaning it doesn't return a data type it doesn't return any values all it does is it does things it can produce output it can do some calculations it can do a lot of stuff but it's not it itself is not a function it doesn't have a return value so when you use this in the operating system you run you run your Java code in the operating system, you don't see a number being returned or anything. You just see the program running with the output that you expect. FAC, on the other hand, returns a data type called long. So it's a long integer, meaning that, well, it's an integer with lots of space in it. And I, first of all, feel the need to discuss factorials with you. So I'm going to move this out of the way. And um, the idea of a factorial is that, um, well, we can go from, we can do a loop, which does a repeated calculation from one to whatever. So we can say one factorial is equal to one, two factorial is equal to two times one factorial, which is equal to two. 3 factorial is equal to 3 times 2 factorial, which is equal to 3 times, well, really 3 times 2 times 1, which is equal to 6. And then 4 factorial, isn't that just 4 multiplied by the previous factorial, which is really 4 times 6, which is really 24. I'm running off the running off my mouse pad here. Okay, five factorial on the other hand is five. Well, hold on. Five multiplied by four factorial, which is really five multiplied by twenty-four, which is really well five times four is twenty. Carry the two. Five times two is ten, and two make twelve. So five times twenty-four is hundred and twenty. So you would expect that kind of a trace. That's what a factorial is in mathematics. So we're making a function which computes such a factorial. We're going to divide, we're going to make a table to trace this code. We're going to, we're going to have main here, our main method. And over here we have fac, F-A-C. Okay, and of course we're passing this variable num into fac. 
All right, so main has what variables? Well, we have a scanner. That doesn't really count because that's really an object which takes input from the keyboard, and it's more of a procedure than anything. But num is definitely a variable. It's declared as integer. So we're going to trace num under main and take a look at this other thing, this call, this function call, fac num. And this half of the table deals with go what goes on in the function itself. What I'm going to trace is well, this number, result, and I'm going to trace this counter variable, i. So I'll put i here first and then result over here. Okay, so let's invoke the program. Let's get rid of all this underlining and stuff. Okay, so let's invoke um, the program. And so we start the program. This program gets loaded into memory, and the first thing that runs, the first instruction sent to the central processing unit have to do with the first function that is seen, and that is the function main. So the, the user is prompted to enter a positive whole number, and so the user then types in his keyboard a number. Let's say the number is 5. Okay, so let's say that number is 5. And so num is 5. And so this system out printf will print the number 5. But, but then it has to call a function. So it can't, it can't print this one out right away because it has to call the function first. And that function has to return with a value. And then system out printf can finish, right? And then, of course, as a result, the program can exit. But right now, this program is suspended. It can't do anything until this fact num actually returns with a value. OK. So then we call fact num. So fact num is called. I have nothing to put here because we haven't computed a value yet. But then we have a result equals 1. That's the first thing that's declared and the first thing that's initialized. So result is 1. And then we have this for loop where we initialize a variable i. We say that it's 1. We check to see if 1 is less than num, if 1 is less than 5, because num was 5, remember, right? Num is 5. So it's basically this num and fact num. This is fact 5, really. I mean, if you, um, you want to think of it the right way, this is num is 5, but here fac is being called with the number 5. Okay, so 5 is passed in, 5 is passed into here, and it actually goes here, and then, and then things start happening. Well, where's the only place in this function that num is mentioned? Well, it's only mentioned as the upper limit of the for loop, meaning that all num does is it, te it tells the fact the fact function, how high can it go when it goes in the loop? Okay, so we're at one. I is initialized as one, as we said. So we have one. And then we execute the statement here, the result uh, statement on line 15. Well, result is one and I is one. And so that number gets stored in result and result is still one. Okay, then we go up i gets 1 added to itself, i becomes 2, and then we check to see if 2 is less than 5, because remember, this is the number 5. So let's say, let's check to see if 2 is less than 5. Obviously 2 is less than 5, so we're still good. And then we go result times i. Well, result times i, we look at the last result times the last value of i. 1 times 2 is 2. Okay. So then we add 1 to i again. We come back to the top of the for loop. We add 1 to i. 2 plus 1 is 3. <clears throat> is 3 less than 5? Sure it is. So we go to line 15, and we do result times i. Well, result is 2, i is 3, 2 times 3 is 6. 
6 gets stored in the variable result. We go up again, 1 gets added to i, i becomes 4. So then we we go to the, we go to line 5 we well we check to see if 4 is less than 5 and it is and then we go to line 15 and 4 result times i is 4 times 6 which is now 24 and then 1 is added to i again i becomes 5 is 5 less than or equal to 5 well 5 is definitely equal to 5 and so the statement is still true and so now we have result times i being 24 times 5. Okay, well 24 times 5 as we just calculated earlier was 120. Then i 1 gets added to i and i becomes 6. Is 6 less than or equal to 5? No, it is not. And so once i equals to 6, we jump out of the for loop and then we return the result. What result do we return? It's the last value. We return the value 120 back to uh, public static void main. So that means that this call to fac5 gets replaced with the value, um, put it in red, 120. So this is no longer, this disappears and 120 is output to the console. So then system out printf you'll just see the number 5 and the number 120. Actually, you won't literally see that. It'll be more like this. Um, here, I'll just get rid of all that. So the output, the output, is if you follow the system up printf, we got percent %d with an exclamation point after it. Now, this first percent %d represents the first variable. We know that to be 5 and the exclamation point means we need to put a factorial after the 5 and then we have a space and an equal sign and a space and then another percent %d and we know that that number is 120 and that's our output. That's all of our output. Okay, so that actually is the what we call the iterative factorial. This factorial doesn't do recursion. This is not recursive. It's not recursive because the entire computation is done using a for loop. And so therefore, um, we need to try a different strategy if we're gonna learn about recursion. But this at least gets the, the concept across that um, recursion is, um, the oh, sorry, I just erased the wrong thing that recursion is something which is done very differently. And so one of, the, one of the smoking gun evidences here is that this function, um, this function, while it's still a function, doesn't call itself. There's no place where the function calls itself. And that's one of the hallmarks of recursion is that the function has to call itself. But notice we have fac num here, but fac is never called with an integer value anywhere in this function uh, but it, it does have a result return it does have a return value okay so that's one way that's one thing to look at but um, really let's go back to the slideshow and um, by the way you can actually see what's going on with this function yourself by um, clicking on this replit link over here and you can actually see the code run. Um, let's go to the next slide. So as I said, um, what we were just doing was called an iterative factorial and that's because when we say iterative, we mean that a loop is involved. Things are repeating. There's repetition used, but it's used in the form of a loop. And that's not really recursion, okay? Recursion is when a function calls itself. There's no, I mean, statements are repeated, but in a completely different, in a completely different manner. So uh, we did trace this. We traced this code for you, so we can actually skip most of this slide. And if you want to read the slide yourself, um, a copy of the slide is also posted with uh, this video. Either that, or it's on another uh, another posting 
but uh, there is this slideshow available. What we want to do is we want to um, we want to have that we want to be able to trace this code here. This is the code that um, oh sorry. This is the code that uses recursion. So I'm going to copy and paste it into uh, Microsoft OneNote. And um, okay, let's just go to OneNote and let's get rid of this. Let's get rid of this. Hold on, what am I doing? Can I use a pointer? Okay, let's do a Control V. And we have this shorter code put in its place. Wonderful. Okay, so looks like I, I can't seem to move this. This looks like it's fixed, which is very weird because, oh, there we go. It's just kind of, ah, Microsoft OneNote is just being its usual unwieldy self. All right. We have the same table, but this time we have definitely a recursive, um, a recursive factorial. And where the recursion is taking place is over here if we we see that this function is called rfac and notice there's a call to the same function down here so what we're doing remember the uh, algorithm in fact what what i'm going to do is i'm going to repeat what i just said for the factorial but in a different way um, matter of fact i'm going to go backwards um, Let's just get rid of all this. All right, so uh, using green. All right, um, we're going to go backwards. Five factorial can be thought of as five multiplied by four factorial. Now, we don't know what four factorial is in advance. I mean, this could, I mean, maybe you do, I mean, maybe you do know in advance uh, mentally. But if this was like 100 factorial, you probably wouldn't know in advance. And so we'd say 100 times 99 factorial, <clears throat> which you probably wouldn't be able to mentally compute uh, at a snap like that. And so notice that we're required now to call 4 factorial to figure out what it's equal to. But So then 4 factorial now is called, and that's equal to 4 multiplied by 3 factorial, which appears to need a call to 3 factorial to figure out what 3, fa what three factorial is equal to. Turns out that it's 3 times 2 factorial. And two, 2 factorial is equal to 2 multiplied by 1 factorial. And 1 factorial is equal to 1. Ah, there's something special about that 1 factorial. It's the only one that returns a definite value. Okay, so this is known as a, as a base case. Okay, this is the base case. The most basic case, the most stripped down, absolutely most basic case. No, if you recall, factorials only go as low as one. Factorials are really just a creature of the positive whole numbers. Uh, there is, technically speaking, a zero factorial. Zero factorial, for technical reasons, is equal to one. Uh, apparently, many mathematical professors find it difficult to explain, but if you, you can say that it completes a pattern. You know, that if I, if I divide five factorial by five, I get four factorial. If I divide four factorial by four, I get three factorial. If I divide three factorial by three, I get two factorial. And by the way, uh, how am I knowing this? So 3 factorial is equal to 3 times 2 times 1. Now, if I say 3 factorial over 3, I'm dividing both sides by 3. And notice the 3 cancels. And that's equal to the equivalent of 2 factorial. That's the idea. And so 2, fact two, two factorial is 2 times. So 2 factorial divided by 2 is 1 factorial. 1 factorial divided by 1 is 1. But then what about zero? One times zero factorial. So zero factorial is equal to one over one, which is one. And one factorial over one, which is one. So that's how they come up with the idea. If you work backwards, 
um, that's how they come up with the idea of zero factorial equaling one. Uh, it does work on your calculator. And if you, you know, that's not a rigorous, uh, that's not a rigorous explanation mathematically, but it's, it's a, it's a good enough one. I'm just going to get rid of this stuff. So this is the idea. Notice that we are, we are making with previous calls or, you know, uh, we're, we're actually basically reducing, reducing the number each time and until we get to a base case. Once we have a one, then we can get rid of this guy and replace it with a one. Well, two times one, that's easy, it's two. Well, now we know what two factorial is, right? So we can get rid of this guy. And now two factorial is replaced by two. And now we have three times two. Oh, well, we know what that is, it's six. So three factorial is six. And then we, because we know three factorial is six, we can, re we can replace three factorial with six. And then four sixes are 24. And then finally, 4 factorial gets replaced, now that we know what 24 is. And 5 times 24, as we said before, is 120. Okay, so that is the idea of recursion. Notice we are repetitively calling that function, that, that uh, factorial function call, if you will, with a reduced number each time. We're reducing the number by one each time. And so, and then when we get to the base case, we can now come out of recursion and notice that um, the calls, the calls were going in, sorry, the calls were going in this direction, but when we were solving it, we were going in the other direction. We were actually coming out of recursion and finally coming up with five factorial being equal to 120. So that's the idea behind this sort of stuff. And so let's trace the code, shall we? Um, main is called with five. I inputted five just like last time. And so we're calling fact five, right? Just like last time, it's no different. And then I, I well, there is no I. There is nothing here. In fact, there's just num and result. Well, num is just equal to, well, hold on num is equal to, let's have num, let's trace that, because I think num changes, but there's no i there anymore, because there's no longer a for loop. And so, all right, so then num is equal to five at first, right? Because the call here passes num into this here. Now those two variables don't have to have the same name. I could have called this version of num x if I wanted to, but I just gave them the same name. And because these two functions, these two subprograms are out of scope with respect to each other, the scoping rules allow me to give them the same name. That's the only reason I can get away with giving them the same name. So num is five. So now what about the result? So let's take a look. Num is five less than or equal to one. No, it is not. So this is false. So we go return 5 multiplied by r fact 4. So this is really 5 times r fact 4. Well, num is now 4 because of the next call to fact, right? Fact is called again. 5 minus 1 is 4. Now this number passed into here is 4. And now the result, four is less than, four is uh, greater than one, so this is false. And so now we return four multiplied by r fac three, okay? And so num is now three. The, in the next call to r fac, r is now three. And now we have three here, three times r fac, and then we do three minus one, it's called with a two. And now num is two, right? And then, um, and then two, 
um, gets called with two times R fac one. Okay, let's finally let's finally examine the one closely. It, num is one, and one is less than or equal to one. So this part finally is true, and now I'm returning a one. This statement handles the base case. Okay? This statement handles the base case. So this is actually what's responsible for this program not freezing in a crazy manner. So finally, when num is called with one, we are returning a definite value, one. It, there's no multi... You know, it's, it's not, well, actually, it's 1 times 1, right? Or 1 times, actually, our, well, no, we're returning 1. We, we never get to this line. We never reach this line in the last call. Okay. So when it's 1, this tells us what r fact 1 is equal to. We can now replace this with the number 1. And so r fact 1 is now 1 and 2 times 1 is 2. Okay? Well, now we know what r fact 2 is, right? We know that r fact 2 is 2, and this whole thing gets replaced with 2. And 3 times 2 is 6. So now we know what r fact 3 is, right? r fact 3 was called, and we got the number 6 as it came out of recursion. So now we get 4 times 6, which is 24. Now we know what r fact 4 is. And r fact 4 comes out of recursion and gets replaced with the number 24. Finally, 5 multiplied by 24 is equal to 120. Finally, that is our result. So basically, we come back to the operating system with the number 120. It actually this 120 um, was only generated by the uh, by the function, but then the function has to return, right? The function has to return and replace this call, sorry, replace this call with a number. Okay, and so now we have, um, let's just erase some of my scribbling. So, okay. Let's just replace some of my scribbling. So now for the output values, um, let's do this in red. This num was always a 5, but now rfac5 is replaced with the number 120. And so this goes in place of here so that we read 5 factorial, and then a, there's an equal sign, and then there's the number 120, which this whole function returns with and puts its value in there. Okay, so that's basically what what is happening <coughs> with recursion in um, in Java, and how how the function is called and how it comes out of recursion to give you the result. And notice it's the same result. And notice that as far as the user is concerned, the output is identical to the iterative factorial. All we changed was how it did it. We changed the algorithm. So we made it into this really short, really short uh, code, which is only two lines of code, as opposed to possibly several lines if this were done using, say, uh, a loop. Okay? Um, and in general, this is usually the case. It's usually the case that recursion takes a lot less work to type out than a whole loop. Uh, some students may find it objectionable in that um, recursion is a little harder to think about. It's conceptually a little more difficult, but it's one of those things that is part of grade 11, um, <clears throat> part of grade 11 computer science, and so it's one of the last concepts that we teach. I think I've got one more. There might be a uh, we probably will also do bubble sorting or sorting algorithms. So to run this code, I have a link to a replit over here, down down in the bottom of the of this particular slide, if you want to actually run the code yourself. Okay. Um, so um, now notice that if we go back here, one is actually given the impression that notice the function calls itself nothing. 
notice while that's happening, nothing is going on in Maine. Nothing is being returned to Maine at all during this whole time. It was actually calling itself and calling itself and calling itself. And so notice the stack, the call stack got pretty high. It got up to five. And if you add the num to it, it the call stack had six things kind of stacked up on each other. And when it came out of recursion, it went five, four, three, two, one, right? Uh, as the numbers came out of recursion, then the return values started happening. And then finally, main got its answer. It got the number 120. And um, okay, that's, um, that's the idea that, you know, recursion has a side effect in that even though it has fewer statements, it can quite potentially take up and quite easily take up way more memory in your in your computer because every time a function is called and every time the function calls itself it's making a copy of itself in memory with the changed numbers right like num gets, keeps getting changed all the time with each call and so with each call a completely identical copy of of rfac is being made um, with the one parameter being changed, being num. Um, and we need that base case to tell us when to stop, right? Uh, we can also call it a terminating condition, a condition that says, okay, once we reached here, we got our base case. Now we can return with a definite answer, no more, no further calls, and then everything just falls out of recursion one by one. Uh, very quickly. Of course, both both programs will execute very quickly, mostly because, well, we all have fast computers and it will appear to your own eye, to the unaided eye, that um, both, both programs seem to be pretty quick. So, um, all right. Now, things also get problematic with this function. I've noticed after playing with it a bit, I can only do factorials up to about 20. And I believe that's because of the limitation of the long data type, because I actually declared uh, RFAC as returning a long integer, right? Which means, yeah, you can have, I think, probably 32 bit, I think, with long. I don't know if it's 64 bit, but I know that it craps out pretty quickly. Like, as you get to, when you get to say 100 and, sorry, when you get to say 20, 20 factorial seems to be around the last time it really behaves well. After 20 factorial, like 24, 25, you see a lot of strangeness going on. You see a lot of negative numbers and stuff. So you can, basically this, these recursive functions are trustworthy up to a certain point. And that's because we're hitting the limitations of how big an integer can get. Because factorials, I'll have to tell you, get very big very fast. Um, if you try your calculator, if you have a scientific calculator, you can actually do up to 69 factorial. But the reason you can get away with 69 factorial is because it's not giving you an integer result. It's giving you scientific notation, which is rounding, right? And involves a lot of rounding. Uh, if I used a math package and uh, showed you what 64 factorial gave you, in fact, we could go on, um, let's go on Wolfram Alpha. Dot com. And I'm just going to enter 69 factorial, uh, which is actually um, the highest integer that you can actually uh, compute. And notice this is the answer you get as an integer. Notice this result down here. It's a big result. It's huge. This is a, you know, I don't know how many digits this is. I mean, I'm sure if you had enough time in the day, you could count them. But I'm thinking it's about, well, it says 10 to the 98. So this must have 99 digits, right? According to this scientific notation version. So if I went to 70 factorial, and the reason your calculator most calculators cannot do 70 factorial is for this reason. So let's just do it. Notice that down here in the scientific notation, it's 10 to the power of 100. 
And most calculators, most scientific calculators that students use, don't have three digits in the exponent for scientific notation. You have a maximum of two digits in the exponent. And so this has like 101 digits. Ugh, it's crazy. Okay, these are huge numbers. And um, it's not something that you can come up with in Java. Java can come up with maybe 20 or 30 digits max. And then past that, it, um, it tends to behave really strange. And the, when we get to 100 factorial, let's try 100 factorial in Wolfram Alpha. Hold on. Let's try 100 factorial and 100 factorial. And it will come up with 10 to the power of 157. So this has got 158 digits. If we tried to use this program to find out 100 factorial in Replit using my program, Replit just gives up. I mean, a hundred calls to itself, recursing a hundred times is just too much. And it just gives up and returns the number zero. <laughs> that was my experience with my, with my code. Um, and that's understandable because uh, the long data type isn't really built for that kind of computation. You really have to have a whole other way of doing the math. So, um, now, um, I say here that RFAC works okay with an upper limit of 25 or so. That's actually wrong. I think 20 is more of the upper limit. Because if you try 24, 24 factorial, it returns a negative number. And it's not supposed to. Um, factorials are all positive, and they include the positive whole numbers. So let's keep, let's, let's move on. Um, so this last slide has to do with checking your understanding using palindromes. So earlier you might have chosen to do a palindrome program of your mini assignment. Um, but in case you didn't, a palindrome is a word that spells the same going backwards and forwards. So, you know, words like wow, W-O-W -W, spelled backwards is still W-O-W. -W. Race car, radar, I, level, and repaper. R-E-P-A-P-E-R, -E -E backwards is the same thing, R-E-P-A-P-E-R. -E -E These are all examples of words that spell the same, both backwards and forwards. So, okay, you probably did this iteratively if you did this assignment. If you didn't, do it recursively. Use recursion to show that a word is spelled the same backwards and forwards. So um, for a few clues, you might want to review your string functions in the document, the string data type and its functions, which is included in the course material. Just, just click on the Classwork tab uh, in Google Classroom and you'll find it. Anyway, that is, that is the end of the slideshow and that is the end of both topics. Uh, thank you for your patience.